um, last week when we were doing this, um, someone asked about making an interactable network door. Um, and so we thought that was a pretty pretty fun little thing to try. Um, and so we started, we, we tried it first ourselves and uh, well, we found a whole bunch of stuff that we just hadn't implemented yet that was kind of not related to making the network door, but related to just making it so that we can make network doors. Um, we recorded that and we'll probably like make uh, that video available too, but I think that's, it was, it was a pretty deep rabbit hole. But anyway, uh, on this stream, we're gonna do uh, just the network door part uh, because we've implemented the underlying stuff that's required for it, um, at least uh, on a branch. It's not uh, not live on, on master yet or anything. Um, but yeah, you saw that that video. Uh, like that's what we're gonna we're gonna do. We're gonna make a door. You can you can click, uh, and uh, <laughs> and it'll animate uh, for for everyone in the room, uh, and the kind of state will be synchronized. Um, Oh yeah, I, I skipped intros, but I assume everyone here, uh, if, if you're watching, you probably know what Hubs is. Uh, and uh, I guess a quick intro of who we are is, is probably worth doing. I'm Don. Uh, and, uh, I'm John. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. We did the intro. Done. Okay, um, so what we're going to do today, I broke it down, and I'm just going to read on the screen to, mm -hmm. uh, so that we have maybe like chapters later. Uh, Matt has provided an animated door model that is better than what I can create. That's from... Um, a Sketchfab model that he like reduced the poly count of so that it runs well in hubs. Um, we're going to open that up in Blender and add a component that will represent like the state of our door. Um, we'll add that component to the model, export it, load it in hubs, um, add a similar component that's just the state of the door, you know, whether it's open or closed on the hub side. We'll make it so that you can click on the door uh, to change that state. Then we'll animate the door. Uh, when the state changes, and then finally we'll we'll send that state of the door over the network so that any time anyone clicks on it, the door will animate on all the clients. And I think unless there's anything else dumb, I think we should just go and get started. Yeah, I think, uh, like I said, the only thing I would note about the stuff we're doing is um, more about the concepts than the exact code we're writing. I think um, we're still working on the underlying bits, so things are still pretty rapidly changing. Uh, like I said, when we when we did this the other day, uh, like we, we've done this a few times this week, kind of uh, experimenting with the underlying stuff. And so uh, it will probably look different a week from now, um, but the, the underlying concepts should should stay the same. Uh, but yeah, I think we can get started. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone in the chat. Um, okay, so I have a Blender open and um, I have this door model that um, Matt provide. It's got a little animation in it. So let's see if I click this. The uh, the doors, you know, will animate open and closed. Um, and uh, right now, it's got the hubs add-on, or the hubs, yeah, the hubs Blender, Blender add-on loaded, or the hubs exporter add-on loaded. Uh, but if I go to add component, I'm missing. Oh wow, I'm missing all of the components. Well, you're you're uh you're selecting on something yeah you were in the objects tab okay uh you, you know i can add all these components but i can't add a door component because no such component exists so let's make a component uh, the blender exporter uh i have one here i'm gonna cheat a little bit <laughs> i just copied this by the way i just looked at uh, some simple component um, and i copied it and i pasted it it over here. Um, Dom, do you want to like explain what this is? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so to... so uh, a few things to explain. So what we're doing here is we're actually editing the source code of the Blender add-on. Um, I think when we, uh, w where we want to get to with this is that you should be able to like drop this this sort of file into another directory that, you know, so you don't have to actually edit the, the add-on um, itself. But what we're doing here is just actually editing the add-on. Like uh, John is editing the thing that is in his Blender add-ons directory, and then we'll just reload the add-on. Um, but we're we want to get it to a point where you can just drop drop additional components into uh, into a directory, and then you know it, it'll detect that you've added new components, and and uh, it'll load them up. Um, but we have basically component definitions for every um, component that we that we have. Uh, set up in the Blender exporter right now. Uh, and all the component definition is is just a little Python class that extends Hub's component. 
and then has has a little bit of um, metadata about uh, well what to name it. Uh, like the name is like that's what actually ends up in the GLTF file um, as as the the component name, and like that's what we'll want to target in hubs. Uh, you'll see later when we're making an inflator for it. The display name that's like what it's going to display in Blender, and then the rest of these are about just like how how do we want to show it uh, in Blender, like on what kinds of objects should you be able to add it to? Um, what uh, category does it show up in, in the in the uh, the menu? Um, panel type is like, which panels does it show up in? Like the objects panel, the, like the bone panel. Like, so this is saying that we can add this to objects and bones um, and it's can be added to nodes as opposed to like materials or uh, like textures, that sort of thing. Um, and then you just define a bunch of properties. If you're at all familiar with Blender, um, this is the same way you set up properties for anything in Blender. Um, Blender has all these sorts of different property types you can use. Um, and so bool property, we're setting up a single property here called is open. It's a Boolean, it could either be true or false. And then uh, the name is, is the, uh, uh, the name it's gonna show, the description will be like when you hover over it and then we can set a default value. So um, yeah, it's really simple. If we, uh, we can look at like another component too, just as an example, um, I don't know. Yeah, so you can see these are just like same thing. They just have some properties. Um, you can do a little bit more with these components. Um, and I think uh, there was a Manuel uh, in Imaginer did a, a long stream kind of explaining how how all this stuff works in more detail. If you want to check that out in the the video uh, recordings uh, on this this Twitch channel, um, but like you can customize how the how the UI is rendered for it. You can customize like gizmos that are shown. You can add uh, migrations for it. So, like, if you if you change the component over time, you can add like things to upgrade between versions. Um, so there's there's lots of stuff you can do in here. But for the simple component, we just want some properties. Like, we don't even uh, we don't need to do anything custom. And it'll uh, by default the UI it'll show will just render all of the properties that you have set. Um, so okay, so you've you've saved that in the appropriate place. You've made a door component. And now we just yes. need to reload the the add-on. Um, so we have a little script in this Blender file that just reloads the add-on. You could also just restart Blender. Um, I use this script a lot when I'm working on the Blender add-on just because I want to make make changes quickly. I want to keep testing stuff. Um, and so all this does is unload the add-on, like clean up, and then reload the add-on. Um, okay, so I've clicked that button. I've run that script. Yep. And now we have a door uh, component that I can add to this object. So I'm gonna add that and I'm gonna say the door is gonna start closed. So it'll be uh, you know, not not enabled. Mm -hmm. And um, so you see that is open property shows up there. You can you can check it to set the value and then um and and we've put that on a node in the graph. Um like whatever you had selected. Um yeah, where you wanna put this, this like the door or something. Yeah where you want to put this kind of really depends on the rest of the code you're gonna write. Um it, it really it, it it's going to vary, right? Um, like with all the other components, like maybe it's operating on that specific object, maybe it's operating on other objects, and cause you can in component properties you can point at other objects too, like we do for uh, like video texture target and video texture source. Um, there's lots of flexibility here, but this is like the simplest thing ever. It's like okay, it's just a boolean, and we're going to put it on on there. Um, so then, yeah, now we can export this this GLD. Okay, uh, I'm going to call this. Um... I'm going to save this. I'm going to save it directly in the hubs models directory uh, because I don't have like um, a, a convenient place to put this on the internet right now. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't want to jump through that. And so I'll just have, since I'm running a hub server, a web server for hubs locally, that server will also, will also just um, serve this file. Um, but yeah, yeah you generally be... wouldn't want to do this exactly. Like you probably don't want to bundle um, your models with, with, the hubs client itself. Um, it depends on what you're doing. Like if you're adding a, um, like we do bundle some models, like for example, the camera tool and the pen tool, those models we actually ship with hubs because like they're kind of conceptually part of the client. Um, but like we imagine this might be your scene, for example, um, th these doors are just going to be in your scene file. Um, we're, we're doing it as a file we can drag in just for, for easier testing. But um, yeah, like you could just have this be a scene. Uh, but we'll put it here for now. Okay, I'm going to export that and um, go to hubs and go to the door. Oops. Um, 
I don't know how to answer that question. Uh, <laughs> um, duck throwing is a series of components uh, that in include physics and grabbing and, and all sorts of stuff. Um, yeah, right, let's I'm look doing, at. I'm doing a, a, a questionable thing here by loading the GLB file, grabbing the JSON on it, out of it, and then I'm going to pretty print the JSON just to see like what was in that model that we um, exported. Yeah, you could have exported it as a GLTF as well to, to see the text representation. Um, but yeah, now you can see that we have that node and there is a Moz Hubs components uh, extension on it. And we have that door component with the is open property. Um, yes. So yeah, GLTFs are just are, are just JSON files. Uh, GLBs are JSON files plus a bunch of binary stuff packed in with it. Um, like you know, the mesh data and all that. Uh, like a GLTF has all those separated out, um, but you can still look at the JSON part of a GLTF file and and see uh, you know to confirm that things look look good. Uh, okay, so things I think, look good. So I think um, I need to get the URL of this. Uh, I'm gonna cheat a little bit and go to camera tool where we load some model. Uh, load load model loading object source. Yeah, and this this part um, again has to do with just the fact that we're we're throwing the asset into the hub's model directory. Um, you could also just get this URL uh, to an asset on the internet, for example. Like if you if you uploaded it to uh, a Google Drive or something, or just a web server, um, you could just grab that URL. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna just cheat and uh, grab the URL that it generates. So when you when you include a model file, uh, when you import a model file into one of your JavaScript files, um, Webpack will uh, return the URL of that uh, of that model. Um, and so this is how you would do it if you're bundling models into the uh, into the client. All right. Uh, so this should on load spit out a, a a message where I can grab the URL that web that. Uh, uh, is it Webpack that generates it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. That Webpack created. Uh, so I have that that link. And now if I paste it, then the normal code that loads models will notice that that it's a model, and this is the the door that we had in Blender. Now and this nothing. and like I mentioned before, like this um, this code we're running right here is a new is a new uh, branch we're working on where like now these are being loaded all through this, the new BDCS stuff and not. Um, not a frame, so like those are not a frame entities, and it's not using the old um, GLTF component mappings or anything. This is all like a new a new workflow. But you can see that the GLTF loads. Yes, um, we'll probably want to dig into that a little bit later. For yeah. now, I think it's okay to say, well, we've loaded a, that GLTF. It had a component in it. How do we how do we get that component? Mm -hmm. um, how do we notice that there's a component? And in fact, there should be a warning in here. Uh, every time I loaded it, that says failed to inflate unknown component called door um, because it noticed that component, but it didn't know what to do with it. So um, that's happening in load model. But in order to add support for um, the door component, we need to say um, we have this concept again called inflators. Um, Again, meaning we had inflators for the A-frame entities that we were inflating from GLTF models, and we just used the same name. It's like you, the, yep. the GLTF is going to describe some game objects that you, that you want uh, or some component data. So once you see that uh, the data in the GLTF file, then inflate it in the world of hubs. Um, so I'm going to add door. Yeah, this, this is equivalent to the thing we have right now called GLTF component mappings. Um, it's just this this map here from name of component in GLTF to function that does stuff uh, to uh, an entity that uh, that component is on. Yeah, so I'm going to create a file called the door and later. Uh, we still haven't figured out exactly what to do about like material components and that sort of thing. But um, right now, we're just working with components that are on entities. And you see this function gets uh, the, the BDCS world, the entity that the component is on, and then the component properties. And the properties are directly from the GLTF file. So that that is open is 
is just that that false value we got in the GLTF file. Um, and we can, uh, if you want to open like another inflator, like uh, uh, the text one, for example, that one. Um, like here's another example of an inflator. This this handles the troika text. This one's interesting because this one actually creates an object three D. Um, so like the door one doesn't have any sort of visible thing in the world, but inflators can add uh, visible things in the world to the, to the scene graph. Um, it's important to note though that like when you have an inflator um, that adds uh, something to the scene graph, uh, you can only have one of those on a component. Like it's it's invalid to have a text and a mirror or a um, a, uh, like to put a text on a mesh, for example, because like the mesh already has uh, a thing in the world. Um, so you can't also be a text. Um, this was valid before an A-frame because everything actually ended up becoming children of the thing you were adding it to. Uh, but that, that uh, as we explained like last in, in last week's stream, one of the goals here was to reduce the number of extra things we're creating in the scene. So uh, one way to do that was was by making it so that, okay, like when you're actually declaring, and this also just simplifies thinking about things too, because you don't have to think about, oh, like this component actually is on the child of, or the parent of this thing, because like the mesh is going to be underneath it. Um, so yeah, so when you're creating a thing that has, that, that adds an object 3D, um, you can only have one of those. Uh, our door doesn't have that. Um, our, door, our door only um, adds component data, as you can see on the right. The, the yes. door inflator is super, super simple, at least right now. Um, and I've imported this non-existent component called door, so I'm going to declare and define that component. And it's going to have only one property called is open. And we don't have Booleans here, so we use the smallest number. And um, typically, if we have like more than one Boolean, then we'll just say flags and use bit masks and say, OK, uh, uh, well, I won't demonstrate that here, but just note that this is a number because, well, we don't have Booleans mm -hmm. as component data here. Yeah, so the smallest it, thing we could represent is eight bits there. And so like we could use that to store eight Booleans is what you were, uh, is. Yes, it might be nice to, to have uh, the ECS API say, okay, types bool is actually going to be stored in a UI aid or however many Booleans. Um, whatever size yeah. number needing to support, and then it'll automatically create the, the properties, the bit mask and whatnot, yeah. but yeah, meh, we don't have that now. Um, okay, so uh, I have a door component added to this entity on load. This this inflator should run. You can put a message in that inflator too, just to show that, that it's running. Inflating a door component for this EID and the default value is, is open. Um, and then let me make sure I'm, I've am i got it in the inflators map. Okay, so when it sees door in the model, it should call this inflate door function. Um, and it's important to note again, that like components don't do anything, right? Like a component is just some data, so like, We've added this door, and we do see that our inflator is running. Um, what you should be doing in that inflator function is not much, right? It's like basically adding components to the entity, um, and then like maybe creating an object 3D if it needs to do that. We're thinking about maybe separating those two concepts. That's still something we're 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 working on. Like maybe maybe like creating objects is actually separate from from uh, adding components to entities. But like this is just your spot for reading the GLTF data and converting it into BDCS components. Um, and so that's all that's happening so far here. So now we have an entity in the world um, that has that component on it, but because we haven't told it to do anything, that doesn't do anything. Yes, okay, so uh, now I wanna go and do something with the door. Um, I'm going to add a system somewhere. Uh, I don't think it really matters very much where, so I'll put it here, the door system, somewhere in the middle of the tick. It's worth it's worth explaining a little bit there. Like like choosing where to run it in the frame is an important thing. Um, usually you'll have some constraints about where you want to put it. Uh, we don't have a good way of making that clear right now or making it explicit. Um, but for example, we probably want to run this only because we know what the functionality we want. Uh, we know we want to run this like after um, 
all of the interaction stuff has happened because we want to be able to click on it later. And we, we know we want it to happen between network uh, send system and network receive system because we know that we're going to want to network this later. So like that's really the constraints here is just those things. Um, and so then where we put it relative to you know the media frame system or something like that doesn't matter. Um, but we have to put it somewhere. And so we put it there. Mm -hmm. um, it will be would be nice to have some better system for declaring what the dependencies are for door system within the frame. This has to go after this system, and I don't really care about all these other systems. Yeah, and this will also change like once we um, start moving to more of a plugin model or something. Like obviously, we don't want you to have to edit edit this file because it would be nice if you could make client changes without literally editing the client, um, so that then you can install a plugin or something. And so there'll need to be a way to say, okay, where do I want to run my system relative to other systems? Um, um, and a BitECS system is, is, again, just a function. Like, there's nothing special about it. Um, BitECS doesn't have a concept of systems, per se, uh, like a, a API-level concept. It's more of just a, a design concept. Um, and so you can have whatever arguments to this thing uh, you want. Typically, most of the systems you've written just, just take the world. Um, some of them might take some additional arguments. Um, and so the, this little template we have set up here, uh, we create three different queries. Um, we have the door query, which says, give me all of the entities in the, when I, like, give me a function that when I call it with a world, will give me all of the entities with this component in the world. So that, so that door query will give me all the entities that like the IDs of all the entities that have um, a door component on them. Um, and then from that query, we can create uh, an enter query and an exit query. And what that does is um, whenever new things are added to that query, uh, and then you call the enter query, it'll give me all of the entities that now match that query that didn't last time I called this, uh, this, uh, this enter query. And same thing for the exit query, this will give me all of the entities that now match that query or that now no longer match that query that did match that query last time I called it. Um, so this is like a really convenient place to, to do like a uh, setup and tear down for, um, for components, um, especially in a really simple system like this, where it's like, okay, I know that um, I'm only matching on this one component. Um, the enter query is, is a proxy for just like, okay, this thing was created with this component. And then the, the exit query is like, okay, when it's gone. Um, if you're matching on more components, there might be more, opportunities for when the exit query might happen. Like, well, when I remove one of the components, I'm gonna get that exit query. And so like, then I might need to do some more work to decide what what I wanna do. Um, but but in the simple case, it's like, this is where we can do uh, set up and tear down. Um, yep. Okay, I'll run this and make sure that when we load the door you are by URL, we see inflating the door component. And then um, on the next tick, there exists a new door. And that ran in, in our door system uh, in that enter query. And uh, of course it only ran once. So yep. I'm gonna go open our to-do list thing, uh, door file, animated door. We got the animated door model, added the blender component to the exporter, added it to the model, exported it, added the door component. Okay, uh, let's make the door clickable. Mm -hmm. um, I have a little snippet to help with this, so I might use that. Um, yeah, so so um, so there's a few different ways we can do this. Uh, so to make something clickable, there's a number of components we need to add to a thing. Um, and we want to make this a little bit easier by just kind of combining them together in a way. Um, but for right now, what you need to do is you need to make it so that um, the thing is raycastable by the cursor, which means that when when we're um, looking around the scene to see what has this cur what is the cursor touching, uh, we want to consider this object. So that's what cursor raycastable means. Um, then when we're uh, considering what objects you're hovering on in terms of the interaction system, uh, we want this to be considered as a remote hover target, and that's a, um, that means that it's something that can be hovered on by the cursor. Um, those are slightly different than cursor raycastable. Like it's slightly different than cursor raycastable because cursor raycastable just means the cursor is going to collide with it, um, and so you could like have something that you want. Like yeah, like a wall. Like you might want to be cursor raycastable, but not hoverable in terms of like it won't. The cursor shouldn't turn blue. Like you're not hovering on something, um, but but the cursor you want the cursor to collide for, with it. Um, and then single action button is a thing we have 
um, that simplifies um, the kind of interaction where I just want to be able to click on a thing and then do something, but I don't want to grab it or anything like that. I, this is not like a, a drag operation or anything. It's just like, okay, when I click it, I want to do something. Um, and so that's what these these three components do. We'll probably combine these together, at least in, in like a utility thing that maybe you just call it interactable or like clickable or something like that. Um, but these are the yeah. three you need. And so like um, we're right here inserting it in the inflator for the door component um, because we're saying, okay, what it means to be a door is that it also needs to be clickable. Um, we could also have added these components to Blender and then added them to like, these are not exposed in Blender, um, but like we could have added them to Blender and then added them all to the to the uh, the door itself. But like right yeah, now we're saying that- a clickable component right. that, that when loaded in hubs adds these three sort of gameplay specific components maybe. Right, but right now we're saying basically what it means to be a door is also that it is clickable. And so we're okay with just adding this in the inflator. Um, and if other things add these components, it's fine. Like you can you can add the same component more than once. The only only one of a given component can exist on an entity. Uh, but I believe calling add component with with a component that's already on the thing is is not an error. Um, um, that should allow us to do a thing where um, we we can click on the door. So I'm gonna make this full screen again. Oops, not that. Um, I'm gonna make this full screen again and say, okay, what it means to click on something is if it has this interacted component on it. Yeah, and we're defining Interact this clicks function here, but this would be like, you know, you we probably have a utility for this that you would yes. just use. Um, so now every tick in the door query, I, I if the door was clicked, so like if clicked the EID of the door, I'm gonna log that. Uh, the door was clicked. I um, mean, we can look at the code for the interaction system too. It's actually not that complicated, um, but yeah, there you go. So now every time you click the door, you get um, you get this this message. And like we're not we're not firing an event or anything. Like that's a, that's kind of an important um, thing we tried to do in this new system is we always want to know when code is running, um, and we want to try to not have we want to try to have as little interaction as possible. And so. The way this click thing works is like it's always happening in the the door system, like always at that part of the frame. Because like we were talking about, like where you put that thing uh, in the it, relative to other systems matters, right? Because like the systems that are going to run before you and after you matter, and so we care about when this code is running. Um, and so we didn't want to have a thing where it's like, okay, I have a click event that's going to run at some arbitrary time. Like I know when that's going to run. It's not it's not an event. I'm just checking some some value. I'm checking does this thing have the interacted component on it. Um, and it will have the interacted component on it because the single action button system runs before our system and the single action button system looks for things that were interacted with uh, or like things that were hovered and and then you press the mouse button basically uh, and then we'll add the interacted component to them. Um, yep, um, okay, so we can click this thing um, mm -hmm. and um, now we want to do something on click. We want to animate the door. Um, this one's a little involved. So again, I'm going to go to my little cheat sheet um, and grab some code. We'll explain it, but I won't try yeah, this to is, write it perfectly exact from scratch. This is a little bit more involved. Um, we don't have a um, system for doing uh, the animation mixers and whatnot yet. Um, this will be come a little bit easier as we as we flesh this out. Um, but I think most of the code will 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 not change too much. Um, so uh, this is this is a three js concept, but but a high level um, overview is like, okay, you can create animation mixers. Um, and an animation mixer is a thing that manages a bunch of animation clips that are running on a uh, on a mesh. Um, and the GLTF file, um, when we exported it from Blender, we had an animation in it, and um, we can get that list of animations and combine it with an animation mixer, and then generate an animation clip for one of the animations, and then play play and pause and and, and control that animation. Um, 
So we'll 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 go over the the specific code here. Um, in a second. Okay. But, uh, but uh, most of this is just, again, 3JS kind of code. And, and that was another kind of thing we talked about last week. One of the goals here is that if you're familiar with 3JS, uh, you should be pretty comfortable here um, working with this stuff. OK, uh, so I've changed this file around a bit um, and added some things. So now, uh, whenever we get a new door, um, the scene that we loaded from the GLTF file is going to have a mixer associated with it, an animation mixer. So this will go and find that um, the ancestor that has the mixer to so that we can hold on to the animation mixer as well as the animations. Um, we're going to create an animation action. This is, again, using the 3JS API for animation mixers. Um, set some properties on it so that uh, once the door opens, it stays open. And once it closes, it stays closed. And um, store that in just this map that's local to this module um, mm -hmm. so that we can pull out from it later. And um, you, you'll notice there we're, we're, we're making some sort of hard-coded assumptions here. We're saying that um, we're going to use the first animation in the GLTF file um, to play to, uh, um, that's the one we're going to use. If you were doing this for real, your component might work similar to the loop animation component, where you can select what animation do you want to play uh, you know, your 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 model might have a bunch of animations, and so which animation do you want to play when this door, uh, like when the door is clicked? Um, and then the other assumption we're making here is this this mixer thing. Um, that first line will almost definitely change API wise. Like we'll we'll have a way for you to get a mixer for a model or something. Um, but for right now, we just kind of walk up the tree and find it. Um, yes. And and again, we're doing that in the enter query, so we do that once per entity, and then when we when we remove it, we make sure to clean up uh, anything we created. And so we uh, the, the the first stuff is, is kind of 3JS specific. It's like, OK, clean up the mixer, um, uh, you know, stop the animation and clean up the mixer. And then we delete it from that map that we, we stuck it into. So it's, a, it's always important to uh, to clean up after yourself. So anything anything you're creating in, in one of those enter queries, you should think about, OK, what does it mean to clean that thing up after the fact? Um, some of this stuff is handled. We have this system that, that cleans up things. Um, but since we're building our own new kind of component here, uh, this is where it's handled. For, for components that um, create objects, uh, we, we tend to clean those up in the remove object 3D system. Um, and so you, you'll see we have a bunch of things. So like when we remove a text, there's a way to clean up the text. Uh, like the text object has a disposed thing. Um, and uh, so this is the appropriate place to do it if you're creating objects, but if you're, um, you know, just creating some state that's local to your system or whatever, uh, the appropriate place to do it would probably just be in a remove query uh, on the system that is is dealing with that component. Okay, uh, so now every tick, we check if you've clicked the door. We we say whether uh, we toggle whether the door is open. Um, if it's open, we play the animation forwards. If it's closed, we'll play the animation backwards. We'll unpause the animation because when it um, when the when the mixer finishes playing the animation through, it'll pause it, uh, and then we pl play it. Uh, play has no effect, I think, if you're if it's already playing. And so, like, if the door is halfway open, and then we play it in reverse, no, nothing bad will happen. And it's also um, true that if it reaches the end of the animation, like, so the door has fully opened, and then we call play, it's still at the end of the animation. Um, so it doesn't do anything. We have to reset it if we wanted to. And that's because we set it to not loop and to not, uh, 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 and we set it to clamp at the end. So, so it will we'll stop at the end there. Yeah. Uh, and then we update the mixer um, with uh, how much time has passed since the uh, previous frame. Yeah, that, that's another one of the lines that that almost definitely would not belong in this system because we probably have a system that manages animation mixers for you. Um, and so, like that that doesn't really belong in this code. That would belong in, in sort of some hub's core code that, that manages animation mixers. Um, but, but yeah, a 3JS animation mixer, every frame you have to tell it how much to advance the animation by. So we'll that there. Quick question from Chris. Um, is there anything wrong with the syntax I've been using for finding the mixer? And got a little sample snippet there. Um, yeah, so that that is the uh, A-frame uh, version of it. Like we're no longer using A-frame at all in this new code. so. Um, that that is the correct way to do it uh, with ex the kind of current hubs components, um, and we want to have probably something similar for the new BDCS world. So, 
Um, that's why th that, that's what I mean by like the current thing we're doing where we're, we're just, we happen to be sticking a mixer onto a GLTF and then, and then we're, we're grabbing it um, uh, is, is, is kind of a little bit weird. Uh, we want something kind of similar to what you're doing right now in A-frame land. All right, I'm gonna load the, the, the model again, inflating the door component. And then when I click on it, boom, the door is animating and I can animate it open or animate it shut. And you can click on it when it's in the middle of an animation and it'll just start reversing because uh, of the way we, we did it. We just we just said, okay, like depending on this state, um, either be playing forward or backwards and, and we don't move around the playhead position or anything like that. So it just, it, from exactly where it was, it just starts reversing uh, or playing forward. Okay, um, now it's not networked. So if I join the room with another client, um, they will see the door loaded, but the mm -hmm. uh, and in the right spot and everything. But the state of the animations we haven't said anything about over the network. So if I open these doors on the bottom, on the top they remain closed, and you know the top can independently open and close them. Yep. And the reason you're seeing the doors at all is because the, the you're dropping in a GLTF model, and the the template for GLTFs, uh, like when when the, the code we have for when you paste something, we spawn a thing. Like that is that media loader is a networked object, and so it's network instantiated, and and uh, uh, you, that's why you're seeing it on the other side. Um, but the custom door logic we have nothing about that is networked. Okay, so let's add networking. Um, for networking, um, I want a duplicate of this state that will be the state of the networked door. The um, so that if somebody else opens the door, they'll tell me, hey, the, the door is now open. And then I can compare it to my local copy of the door and say, is my local copy the correct state? Is it is it out of date? Um, and so um, I'm going to create a networked door component that looks just the same. Uh, when I inflate the door, I'm going to also add the networked door component and set its state the same way. And we also need to add the networked component to make this thing networked too at all. Ah, yes, this thing needs a networked component. Um, okay, so networked and networked door is added to our imports. Um, let's see. And so this is an, another thing um, in the kind of current, um, you may not know this, but in the, in the current implementation of, of our GLTF stuff, some components, and you'll see this in the Blender add-on actually, like you have to declare a component as like networked. And that's so the Blender add-on can add the networked component for you. And we like pre-generate IDs at export time. It's like kind of complicated. Um, luckily in the new in the new system that, that goes away, um, you can still add the networked component uh, just like we did for like the, um, um, uh, the, the cursor raycastable and all that stuff. You can add this in the inflator um, or or to the GLTF file. What we're saying here again is that like all doors are network doors. There doesn't exist a door that is is not networked. Um, that's just what we've decided we're implementing. Um, so it's kind of invalid to have a door without a network. So we add it here. Um, mm -hmm. If we wanted to have like the option of having doors that are maybe networkable or not, well we could have two com like we could we could make add this network door component to Blender and then um, add add that in Blender to the doors we want networked and don't add it to the doors we don't want networked. Um, but since we want all, all doors to be networked doors, we just um, we just add them both the components here. Yes. Um, okay, so in the door system, now uh, I'm only gonna send door state if I'm the one who's changing the state or if I, if I own it. Um, and so when I click it, I'm going to take ownership of the door. Uh, take ownership is a function in netcode. the netcode. So actually, I should just grab this. Take ownership from here. And is netcode in the same directory? No, netcode source component. Sorry, this is not. I think you have it correct on that first line. It's one directory up and then, oh, it's not. Um, we made it okay. Um, so when we click on it, I'm going to take ownership 
of the entity. I'm going to say that the uh, networked door state, uh, I'm going to swap the networked door state instead of the door state. Um, and now instead of uh, only when I click change the local door state, I'm going to say if the networked uh, state doesn't match my local state. Uh, door dot is open the ID. Then go ahead and um, uh, sync with the networked state. Yeah, so I think you need to import network door, and then I think take ownership needs a world as well. Ah, uh, yes, the John special for getting to <laughs> call functions with to world. Um, is, that, is that right? Uh, is that all the arguments that you? I think it is right. Of yes, whatever. taking ownership, yep. world and EID, and that's it. Okay. Um, so that's not all because we're still not sending the data for the networked door component over the network. We need to tell the uh, the networking system that. Um, okay, how does this work? For each component there is a way to sync information about that component. Mm -hmm. um, and what that means is that we're, we're going to ask you to implement like a serialize and deserialize function that when you're the owner, you will serialize data onto a buffer. And when you're not the owner, you will like deserialize and pull information off the buffer. Um, we have a, a defined network schema default for this, which will just give you a an implementation of serialize and deserialize. It just takes all the component data from a, a, a bit, bit ECS component and, and sends that and receives that in some Yeah, and it uh, also handles the fact that um, yeah, when it'll only send the properties that have changed and all that. Like the default serializer is probably what you will want most of the time. Um, if, if you are doing something clever with your components, maybe, maybe you'll, you'll need to use something else. And that's something else, again, it's just an object that has a serialize and deserialize function. And you can see the signatures of those functions there. Um, th this implementation just looks, looks at your, the, the schema for your BDCS component and then uh, serializes all those properties. Um, so that's all we have to do here. Okay. And I think if we did it right, then now when we, whenever we take ownership, we're going to change the, door, the network door state send that over the network at the next time we um, are going to just send network state and everyone including ourselves whenever the network state is different from our local state we will update our local state and play the animation i'm going to load the model here's my door there's and... a question in the chat about if we've seen any performance improvements um to you know moving away from a frame um we haven't really looked into that too much yet um that is an expected goal um i think um one of the things we'll see is just by reducing the number of entities and stuff in the scene um we should see some performance improvements and just just by reducing the amount of stuff going on in general um uh but we haven't really like been targeting that and also most stuff is still using a frame right now um but that's that's increasingly uh, changing. Yes. Um, okay. We now have a door who's animated and either party can click on it. Um, and it all works. Uh, the only thing that's weird about this is uh, if a client joins when the door is open, if I turn my camera fast enough, I will be able to see that the door uh, animates open. It's going to be kind of hard to demonstrate that actually. Maybe if the door were gigantic, but I can't seem to to scale it up anymore. Well, we don't have we don't have the scale stuff in implemented. Oh yeah, in branch yet. That and also yeah. when I made it like clickable, like a single action button, it no longer uh, is something I can like pick it. up and walk around with. Yep. Uh, but okay, so we didn't implement anything that says uh, when the when you when you first load if the animated door is already open then like skip to it being totally open and so you you will see things kind of animate into place right when you join mm -hmm. and uh that's it um yeah i think um if we wanted to do that that sort of 
more um more correctly synchronizing the state of the animations i think we could we would synchronize more properties about animation mixers like right now we're just saying we're just synchronizing the whether the door is open or not um if we really cared about the actual visual animation being in sync more um, what we might do is like actually synchronize oh the playhead position of the animation similar to what we do for videos um where it's like okay i don't just care about um whether the door is open or not i care that you're on this frame of the animation uh and this specific animation we're gonna have different animation clips and whatnot and and so we, we might at some point build like a sort of facility for networked animation mixers um and then and then we would we would maybe use that for this um but but yeah like i, I uh, like you saw um networking properties is actually like pretty simple right you just you just say which components you want to network and then the networking system takes care of doing the right thing about um whoever's the owner will be the one synchronizing out this property whoever's not the owner will will synchronize uh that property from the network um, and then your job when writing a network system is mostly just to say, okay, what's the network state? What's like my local state? Like, let me apply that difference. Um, and when you're the owner, uh, like, what's the network state that I want? Uh, and, and so, and so change it that way. Um, one thing that might be a little bit um, surprising if you are not used to this style of networking um, is that like we just say uh, that we're the owner. We just we take we take ownership and then we immediately start acting as if we're the owner. Um, the way our networking model works, um, both both the current networking model with Network Dayframe and this new networking model, is we basically just act as if we're the owner, um, and people will either listen to us or not, um, and eventually we will agree. Um, so um, say both of us. Uh, say, say there's three people in the room and, and two people click on the door at the same time. Both of them think they're the owner because they, they said they took ownership and then they immediately start acting as the owner. And so they'll, they'll both say the door is open or closed or whatever, whatever state they want to send out. Um, both of those people will send out some information that they think this is what the network state should be. Um, and then everyone will start receiving information. As I'm receiving that, um, I can look at them and decide, okay, like who do I actually think is correct? Um, and that, that we always come up with, we all always come up with the same answer based on the time that last ownership changed. Uh, and then if, if they even change it in the same time, well, happens to be that the person with a lower network ID, whoever that happens to be just wins. Um, it's arbitrary, it doesn't really matter. And that also shouldn't really happen. Um, but the important thing is that we all come up with the same answer. Um, and so, even if I like, if I click the door and you click the door at the same time, uh, I'll think I'm the owner at that moment. But as soon as I get your your packet about you becoming the owner and, and some new information, I'll see that and I'll apply your state uh, instead. And so then I'll I'll lose ownership immediately. Um, so it it's it's a bit weird, but it makes it kind of nice to write um, write networking code because you don't have to be like, okay, take ownership, then wait until I have confirm that I am the owner and then do something. Cause you also then end up with the same problems because that takes time. And then I confirm that I'm the owner but then someone else took ownership while that was happening. So like this just assumes the the, the very common case uh, that you take ownership and then you, you are the owner. Um, and in the case where it's not like, like I said, it, it, it is eventually consistent. Yep. Okay. Um, I'm not seeing a bunch of questions. Uh, if people have specific questions, happy to answer them. I wonder if it's worth talking about how we loaded the GLTF model, how inflators work and dig into that a little bit, or if we should end here and say, yep, this, we, we did it. And, and that was <laughs> a successful stream. Um, yeah, I think we can talk a little bit more about, um, inflators maybe um and then also yeah please feel free to ask some more questions more 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 cool you mentioned storing booleans as bit masks what does this mean for other variables okay uh maybe an example will help here because i think we do have yeah we just implemented it with uh media loaders right i think i think so didn't that have flags um Yes. Okay. Media loader is a 
component that has a source property which is its own special thing maybe maybe floaty object maybe something that is not also using the string type weird uh, i think it's fine we can we can I, I think the media letter flags uh are fine to explain like let's just do that okay um okay so media loader flags media loader flags here um when you load some uh actually i want to go where we set it i want to go to the inflator um just like we inflated the door component if we see a media loader component in a model then we're going to add one of these media loader components which will tell a system later to figure out what kind of media it is and then um create a 3d object for it whether that's a image a video a screenshot of an html document or a gltf file whatever it is and we had these two, two flags that control what the media loader is going to do once it loads that object. Uh, uh, is it going to treat the object's origin as, uh, sorry, I, I don't know how to explain the, what these flags basically, do. Basically, when, <laughs> when you, it's, it's complicated, but when you, when you load a GLTF uh, file, we like to scale it down and center it uh, on the media loader. Um, and we wanted those both to be optional. We wanted to say like, do you want us to scale it for you? And do you, do you want us to center it? Um, yeah. Those are both uh, Boolean properties. And in the GLTF file, we're okay with them them being represented as as this JSON structure with with two properties, um, uh, resize and recenter. Mm -hmm. um, but when we're creating the component data, we would rather be as efficient as we can um, in terms of like how we want to store this thing in memory. And so we're just using one uh, UA, like one eight bit property to store both of these Boolean values. Um, and we're doing that by using these, these uh, like this, this flag. Uh, Sorry, I'm jumping around a lot. Um, <laughs> the, these media loader flags are, well, it's the, the number one and the number, well, two or one bit shifted over once. Uh, so if I yeah. wanted to add another flag, you know the foo flag. I, I do. I do this. If you haven't seen this this uh, less than less than thing. Um, this is pretty pretty common in in programming languages where it's just it'll shift uh, that number of bits over. Um, yeah, you can. This is written in binary, like you know. And, uh, it's important that we. It's a bit mask. It's um. I don't know what. Yeah, say this is it. this is this is like a. a Non hubs related concept. Uh, it's just just a thing. But but anyway, so when you have these you have these these binary numbers that look like this. Now we can we can and them like binary and them with this flags property to basically just just modify that one bit. Um, and then when we're uh, we can then compare against that by just checking uh, that one bit. So you could look at where we're using that or checking that recenter flag, for example. Yeah. Okay. right here uh so um this is when we've loaded the media we're going to resize and recenter it if the media loader component flags for that object has this flag in it this this bit set uh we're using this uh boolean no bit bitwise bit, bit, bit and and bitwise and um if this is non-zero then resize will be truthy uh similarly for recenter so um Yep. Yeah. This um, saves... And yeah, it's important that it's that and the single and and not the double and. Like the double and is is uh, that, that'd be a bug. And, yeah. Um, but anyway, uh, this is again not a hub specific topic, but like you do want to think about when you're when you're um, creating your component data, trying to be as as efficient as possible with that. Uh, yeah. So so these flags are a useful thing to do. Okay. Um, how many vertices does that door have? Is there any guidance anywhere for max number of vertices? Okay, Matt's actually um, answering that in the chat. Yeah, the that door model may or may not be efficient. Um, and in terms of how many you should have, uh, I I don't know off the top of my head. We have some recommendations in Spoke. Um, I think there might be some articles on Crater Lab also about uh, asset creation. 
Um, so I would definitely check those out. Yeah. Okay. Um, not seeing new questions. So back to loading media, loading GLTFs and inflating them. Maybe these templates, these prefabs we have. Where do you, where do you want to go? Um, yeah. Why don't Why don't we um, Why don't we explain how? I mean, this is kind of a complex topic, but we can explain how the media. Like when I paste something, what happens now? Um, Okay. So just so we can go over that, um, or or even we can go over the slash cube command instead. Like that's a simpler version of it. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. Let's go over that one instead. Just just so we can talk about spawn networked object. Mm -hmm. Um. So yeah. So we have a command in hubs right now. Uh. This may or may not live for forever. This is mostly just the testing command. We have a. You can type slash cube, and you'll get um. You'll get a little cube in in the scene with a meteor frame stuck on top of it. Um. And it's 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 networked, so like both people see that thing spawn, and then you know if you spawn a duck or something, you can stick the duck into the media frame on that. Um, we did this last stream for anyone who remembers throwing me throwing ducks and blocks around. Yeah. So um, yeah. So how does that how does that thing work? So um, you'll see the code there. What we do is um, the the important line there is we we say create network uh, network entity. So that um, you give it the world and the name of a prefab, um, and then uh, uh, some. Some you can give you can optionally give it some initial data that'll get passed to that prefab to to customize things. Uh, we're not doing it in the cube case, um, and then that will create that entity on both, like on, on all clients. It'll it'll create a local copy and then it'll network that out to other people. Um, uh, it'll network out the creation of that thing uh, to other people. The properties of that object are networked in the same way that um, we showed before, where uh, you just have all those components that we're networking. And so, for example, position of the object is a network transform um, thing. So if 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 your um, the thing you're you're creating doesn't have a network transform, um, then its position won't be networked. And so mm -hmm. so it'll just spawn at the origin for other people. Um, so we can look at um, where we define prefabs here in netcode. There's, there's similar to how we have that um, that map of networked objects. We have a map of prefabs you can you can create, um, and cube is just uh, one of those prefabs. And the properties of a prefab are you give it the template, which is like the the function to call to generate it, and then you can op optionally give it permissions, which is uh, we only using it for camera right now, where you can say okay, the person has to have this permission in order to to create this object because you can turn off spawning cameras in uh, in rooms, we actually probably should be using that for like this media thing. Once once we're ready to ship that, like you could because you can turn off spawning media. I think it's spawn media. I don't remember what the permission is. Um, something like that. Something like that. But but uh, I'm not positive if that's the name. Um, but anyway, so uh, so let's look at this cube media prefab, uh, media frame prefab. So. Um, so we we sort of touched on this a bit last week, but we've we've created this nice little um, JSX uh, thing uh, that that is this is this looks like if you're familiar with React code, uh, you'll be like, oh, is this using React? It's not using React, but it is using JSX, which is which is just this thing that lets you insert these sort of tags into your JavaScript. Um, the way that we know not to use React is at the top of this file. There's a there's a little special comment that says. Uh, when you see JSX, don't use React create element or whatever. Use create element entity, and that's a function that we've wrote and provided here. And uh, and so you also need to import that right now. I think we I think we'll be able to fix that, so you don't have to manually import it, similar to how React works. But right now you have to do it. Um, and so when you um, create one of these templates, um, the only valid tag type right now um, in in our flavor of JSX is just the word entity. Um, and that creates a BDCS entity. And it's not just a BDCS entity, it's a BDCS entity that um, is that has an object 3D as well. Like we said that um, if you're using this JSX, um, well, in order to have a scene graph, we, we represent the scene graph completely in um, in uh, uh, 3JS land. And so in order for something to have, a, you know, it's a parent with a child and a child, like you have to have an object 3D. So you, so you can't, through JSX, 
uh, through this JSX stuff, right, create an entity that doesn't have an object 3D. Um, if you didn't add a component that otherwise adds an object 3D, like the text component um, or, uh, or a mirror component or something like that, then it'll just be considered a group. Uh, it'll be a three dot group. Um, you also right now, and this might go away, you can just specify the object 3D directly. And that's what we're doing here. Um, you see, we create a three mesh, um, like an, a normal, uh, a normal mesh with a, with a box geometry. Um, this is like sort of an anti-pattern and we probably want to get rid of this. Cause like this, this object 3D is never getting cleaned up right now. Um, so, uh, we'll show other examples yeah, that like kind of do the right thing. But but anyway, you can see we're adding a bunch of components here. Um, and importantly, we're adding uh, the networked component and the network transform component because um, we want this thing to be networked. Um, Maybe if, if do, I take this out. Yeah, if you don't have we... network transform, for example, uh, what we'll see is when you spawn it, uh, well, on the one client, you'll see it spawn in front of you because you spawned it and then we set the location to directly in front of you. That was, that was the other lines of code in that cube. Uh, that slash cube command was just to place the object in front of you. Um, but so, so it'll appear in front of you on the one client, but the other client will just spawn it at the origin because we, we told it to spawn that object, but then we never told it where to put it. Um, so, well, it spawned it at zero, 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 and that's where it's going to stay because we're not telling it to, to network the position anymore. Um, so network transform is just a component that you can add that will network the position, rotation, and scale of that object. Um, and yeah, th this is a nice property of the new networking system that we didn't have in the old in the old system. The old system was based all around these sort of templates. This is kind of what we're calling prefabs in the new one, but we've split out, we've split apart the like, okay, what is this thing? And then like, what is networkable about this thing? And it makes it a lot easier to like compose things where I don't have to like generate a new network schema or something for a thing just to network some properties about it. Um, and it means that like I can network properties of things inside of a GLTF file really easily. Uh, we talked about this a little bit last week, like the, the, the example with a chess board that has a bunch of chess pieces or whatever. I can easily now um, add the like grabbable or, or you know, movable whatever component to a chess piece and then also make it networked transform or ha have a network transform in the network component. And now I can just grab those things and move them around. I didn't have to create like a interactable chess piece template or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't have to add, actually add anything new to the networking system in order to network that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, you, you mentioned this uh, earlier, but I want to repeat it. In the old way we were adding, adding networked components to GLTF files in the Blender exporter or the add-on code, we like generated a unique network ID for that thing. Um, but it made it kind of awkward because when, if you brought in multiple versions of that GLTF well, it's actually file, wrong. <laughs> like, yeah, it, 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 <laughs> it may be awkward is too nice a word. It's just wrong. Yeah. Um, multiple objects would have, would share a network ID. And so we fixed that as well. So if you wanted to create one of those chess boards with each piece being inter independently networking their trans, uh, their transforms, and then you wanted another chessboard. Well, you can just do that, and each piece, each client will deterministically find the correct network ID for each of those chess pieces, and then you can move them around and uh, do yeah, all the things. Right now, the, the the way that um, stuff worked before, the the networkable things you could put into a GLTF file are were, are only intended to be used for scenes of which there will only be one instance of that GLTF file. It's actually invalid right now to like make a GLTF file with like, well, before we rewrote media frames to make a GLTF file with a media frame and like bring in three copies of it. Like actually that was wrong because those three media frames were all the same networked object. So like when you put something into one of the media frames, all of them became full. And it was like, really, uh, you got some really weird behavior. Now media frames are using the new networking system. And so they don't have this problem. Um, but this still would exist for like videos, for example. Like if you create a, a video component and you make it like, uh, networked, which I think is the default, like this is actually not going to work if you bring in multiple copies of the same GLTF file. Um, it'll work if you export it. Like what we typically expect you to do is like this will be a scene. And, and so it'll work as your environment because there is only one ever one environment uh, GLTF loaded. But it's actually invalid right now to create a GLTF with one of these networked components, like the, the A-frame style networked components, and then have multiple instances of it. Um, that becomes like valid and correct now in, in the new system.
Um, because we're no longer encoding the ID into the GLTF file, we're coming up with it at runtime, but deterministically. Um, okay. Uh, the the components here, the, these are much of the same components we saw. Um, like we have cursor recastable and remote hover target, uh, the, those we already saw. Here we also ha have um, hand collision target, which means in VR, um, when I put my hand on it, I should consider that hand hovering on something. Um, and then offers remote constraint and offers hand constraint are um, when I grab while either my hand is hovering that's for offers hand constraint, uh, or when I grab when the cursor is hovering, um, I'm going to create a constraint in the physics system, which means I'm going to attach this object to the thing that is grabbing it, so the hand or the cursor. And that's what makes the object, that's, that's what makes you be able to grab the cube and move it around, is that um, that offers remote constraint. And, and so you can change it to like, oh, this object is only grabbable by hands, but not the cursor, or the other way around, um, by saying, you know, which one uh, it, it's it's uh, hoverable by the hand, or it's hoverable by the cursor, and then offers remote constraint or offers a hand constraint. Um, mm -hmm. It's a bit of a handful and a, and a mouthful or whatever to have to write those all all out. We, I think we've already written it actually, John. Right, the, the inflator for grabbable. Yeah, yeah. We want to make this ergonomic, right? Um, it might be important in some specific cases to say you can grab this thing with your cursor and your mouse, but you can't do it with your hand in VR. And so we may want those degrees of freedom, but oh. for the typical case, you should be able to be like, you can click this thing, you can grab this thing, and um, we'll inflate the, the, the fine grain components as needed. But even if we want that flexibility, uh, so for example, I, I think we do, we do, we might want the flexibility to say, okay, like you can grab it in VR or grab it uh, remotely, but like when I, you can grab it in VR, that's not just adding one component, that's adding two components. Um, and when you mm -hmm. when you want to add it remotely, that's actually adding three components because cursor recastable, uh, uh, remote hover target, and offers remote constraint. So we can still put that into this inflator, right? So we can have, like, if you, uh, if you want to just add, like, the third argument here, we don't have to test it, but just to, to explain how this would work, like, we can pass properties into this that says, like, you know, grab in VR uh, or, and grab with cursor or something, right? Um, and so these are properties. And based on those, we can just decide which components to add. Um, and so then we can make like this ergonomic thing and we can show how to use it too. Um, maybe instead of in VR, grab with hands. Grab with, yeah, uh, right. yeah, that makes more sense. Um, and then we can add only the appropriate components. So even the, the hand collision target and uh, remote hover target and cursor recastable based on those. Oh yeah. Um, but it's like holdable in all those cases, maybe. Um, or maybe it was like an error if you would pass false to both of those. Um, and then we can also like set some default properties here uh, and whatnot. But then how, how, like in order to use this in the inflator now in the uh, cube uh, thing, uh, it's in camera tool, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> um, we would just put grabbable here and then we can get rid of all of those, uh, all of those bits. And then there we can pass in properties. So we can say like, uh, you know, grabbable with hands, true. And, and um, so this, this system of inflators and stuff makes it really, uh, really flexible to be able to, to create nice, a nice interface for, for generating these, these little prefabs um, really nicely. Um, and, it, and it can be separate from the interface uh, of the actual components going on under the hood and your systems are dealing with or whatnot. Um, I'm like, like, this is the same interface we're exposing to GLTF. So like these properties here are the same, so the, these, these things are the same things you would expose uh, in Blender or Spoke uh, to the GL, at the GLTF level. And so we can create a, in, in, in Blender, the grabbable component that has these two Boolean properties that we can set. And then at runtime, it adds all of the components you see on the left. Um, uh, someone's commenting on your, your Emacs foo. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we both, uh, we both uh, use Emacs, it's wonderful. Uh, we use Emacs, but with Vim key bindings. It it answers the the eternal debate of like Vim or Emacs, and my answer to that is both. Uh, and I think Emacs is the best version of Vim I've ever used. 
<laughs> uh, uh, where is this? Yeah, it's here. Sacrilege. Um, yeah, this is this we, is a really we both cool use this distribution um, of Emacs that just kind of comes with a whole bunch of stuff configured out of the box. Um, it's really nice. Uh, I, I would I would check it out if you've uh, if you've ever wanted to use this. This is very. So there's also another distribution called Space Max, um, which which is kind of similar, but I like Doom Emacs better. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's really cool if you want to want a cool text editor. Okay. Uh, da, 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 da. Um, we can we can uh, we can show a little preview. This is really early thing, but that that animation stuff, I think, was kind of cool. Um, I don't know if yeah. you want to do that. <laughs> uh, You're like, oh, yeah. but it's really hairy. I, I'm just just thinking of cool things to talk about. No, no, yeah, that's fine. I mean. We I've been thinking about media loading all week, and so any anything related to this stuff is uh, interesting to me. Yeah, I um, mean, I guess the the first thing is this this whole coroutine routine thing. We we sort of very very briefly touched on it at the end of last stream, and we're still definitely figuring this. This is like very much we're still figuring this out. Uh, yeah, I'm um, not I'm not really ready to talk about the implementation in, because I suspect as I I learn more about generators, definitely and not the we figure it out. But I think if we just look at that load media function. Um, yes, we can we can we can look at that and 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 say how it's nice. Uh, <laughs> yes. So um, we won't get into the details of generators, but like uh, the important thing is like that that function on the left there has a a little star after it. Function star means that we can use the yield keyword in in here. Uh, this is a pretty like advanced topic, so so I, I won't go into the details here, but. But basically, we can say that we want to pause this function um, at different times. So we want to like we want to make this request like this options for, and that that goes off to the reticulum server and asks about okay, like what is this URL? Like tell me about it. Is it a video? Is this a is this a model? And and give me some information about it. But like that takes time to happen, um, and we want to like pause this function until that happens. This is similar to like async await um, if you're familiar with that. But the important difference here. Uh, to a normal async function is when we resume this function, we're going to be in the same part of the frame, uh, like on a different frame, we're going to be in the same uh, system that we were when we paused this function to begin with. So like, we're always in this media loading system. Like remember how we talked about here where like, um, it matters what order this stuff happens in. And so we want to make sure that every part of this, the code dealing with media loading system well, we, that always needs to happen after the network receive system and after, you know, ownership, you know, it, it doesn't really matter in this case, but like it often will matter what systems are running before you and what systems are running after you. And it, it's really hard to work with like asynchronous code when you want to do that. So like if I want to make a, a web request, um, I still want to execute the rest of that after the fact. And so without this sort of generator thing, the way we would have had to do that before is like, okay, we'll set a flag, this tick. It's like, okay, I'm gonna make this request. And then I'll be like, okay, I'm waiting for waiting for options. And then the next tick I'll check like, oh, did the options come back? Oh, it did, let me do something with it. Um, this generator thing allows us to express that sort of behavior in a really nice sort of linear way um, with, with, with this nice language feature. And so, yeah, we can, we can basically pause this function until another frame but we're going to be running at the same part of this uh, of this system, and so I want to repeat that, even though you just said it, just because yeah. I think I want to repeat the the motivation here. Um, we have some async work to do. We got to download things from the network, or we've got to uh, like run run maybe run animation. Well, that's a bad, bad example. We got some asynchronous work to do, but every time we resume execution of some job uh, that includes asynchronous work, we want that. The code to resume right here in between, you know, on ownership loss and physical compat system. So that's what uh, that's why we had this code added this code routine concept is okay. We are going to do some asynchronous synchronous work. It's going to happen in the background in between threads, but but as soon as that's done, we're not going to just immediately kick it off. We're going to do it right here. We're always going to run the next step right here. Yeah, and this avoids the kind of bugs like we definitely have bugs right now in hubs where we'll have code that. Uh, depending on what happened, it might execute in a different order, right? Because like, 
Uh, we're always going to be, uh, if you're doing the normal, if you use async await, the rest of that async block is going to be running in between frames. So actually, it's like all the systems have run, then we'll run like any async things that have happened or any like set timeouts or any events that have fired, and then we'll run another frame. Um, but that like means that the code that was happening at the top of that, like if I if I started an async function in a system and then I, I set await, well, that first block runs at a certain part in the frame. And then the rest of that function runs at a different part of the frame. And that and that that can lead to like really confusing and hard to diagnose bugs. Um, with this, like we know always where like what systems have happened already this frame and what systems are about to happen this frame. So we can we can uh, like really easily reason about what's gonna happen. Um, but we still get the nice semantics here of it's just like, okay, like I can write this thing, I can think about it as just the process that's gonna happen all all, all sequentially. Um, and, and so we do that with with multiple things here. Like we do that with this web request, but then we also do it for this like actually creating the object. So like if we look at um, create image or whatever, uh, or load image, and this is the this is the new code for loading an image texture. Um, this is just more of the same thing. It's like, okay, this is another generator and we can we can yield to load the texture. Like that's an asynchronous process that takes time to do. Uh, then this comes back and then this is when we actually create the entity. Um, but we know again that this entity is being created during the media loading system. Like it's not, it's not happening in between frames. It's not happening. Like we know that, okay, we've created this and now uh, any systems that run after this can use this entity because it's, it's definitely going to be there this frame. Um, and yep. we're still, we're still figuring out exactly how this is going to work. Um, it's still very much a work in progress because uh, we also want to be able to cancel these things. So like we, we want it so that if I was loading a media and then you deleted it, I want to be able to like, back out the stuff, the work I've already done and cleaned it up properly. We're still figuring out the right way to do that. Um, yeah, wait, I wanna, I wanna talk about that as well. So there's two concepts. One is canceling work that was in progress. So in media loader or load media, load image, um, like load texture cancelable, which I'm not gonna go into the details of, but the idea is, okay, um, Dom pasted a link to an image and then immediately deleted it. Well, I got the link to the image and I started downloading the image. I need to, um, and then I, I noticed he deleted the object, the entity. Well, I haven't even finished loading the texture. I need to be able to like cancel it and unload right. the texture as soon as it stops downloading or if I can interrupt the, the in-progress web request, that's great. And then also, um, not only do I wanna cancel it and like undo work that was maybe incomplete, but I also don't want to continue running anything else. So like interruptible uh, in, in this case, if for the load media thing, if the entity got deleted while I was loading the texture for it, then the texture loading would get canceled and I would unload the texture, but also I would never get down to this part of the function. It, this function yeah, would run. not run to completion. Right. Network IDs would never be assigned. I would never resize and recenter this thing, or I would just not do anything else. Yep. Um, and and like I said, the exact mechanism for doing this, we're still figuring out. I don't like what we're doing currently. We're like we're we're still we've been playing with this this week uh, to to figure mm -hmm. out a nice system. But I think once we have it, it'll be really easy to express these sort of like flows of things that are going to happen, um, and and be able to we'll be able to create these nice composable things where we'll have like, okay, well, loading texture can be canceled and we'll, we'll back that out correctly. And you'll be able to create these like kind of composable little units of behavior that then um, will correctly clean themselves up on, on, on canceling and that sort of stuff. If we get it right anyway, I, I still don't know exactly how we're going to do it, but um, yeah. Um, the other thing we can look at is like the animation thing, I think was kind of cool that, that this came out of coroutines as well. Um, a nice way to express an animation turned out to be uh, a loop uh, in a coroutine. Um, and this, yeah. so Unity actually has these coroutines as well. And um, if you're familiar with writing Unity code, it's very convenient to write some stuff using coroutines. Um, and so we're hoping to have sort of that, that similar flexibility here. Um, but yeah, we, we've created an, a very, very rudimentary animation library that we can use that Unlike some of the other animation libraries we have, like we're thinking we're, we use AnimeJS in some other parts, but like, again, it's that same problem where 
the animation changes are happening at a different time in the frame than uh, other stuff. So you might have an animation in AnimeJS running, and then it's going to update the scale of something. But then some other system next frame might might change that too. Um, and obviously, like multiple things might still be competing to set the scale of this object or something. Like that doesn't change. But what changes is I know when I'm running this animation, it's running right here in Media Loader System. And if something is going to change it after me, well, then it can change it after me. But if, if something ran before me, um, like if, if there's a system listed before me, I know that I like this animation is updating at this part in the frame. Um, like again, yeah. and, and I know it makes it a little thinking. easier, a little easier to like step through the um, like one tick of the whole game to figure out like when things are happening and 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 when properties are changing. It also makes it easier to just turn off a whole system. Like if I want to just pause loading media altogether across the app, I can just stop running the main the main loop. Like just mm -hmm. all right, media loading is not happening anymore. So like this animation is not running anymore, right. and, and all the rest. Right, exactly. Like it's it's all going to be together, and this also relates to when we pause. Um, like when you when you tab out, um, the whole request animation frame loop stops, and so we stop running system code. But any of this other stuff that was kind of scheduled during in the normal JavaScript event loop, like that might still run at at kind of whatever whatever the browser decides it's going to happen. So, so by doing this, we're like we're bringing all of our stuff into sort of the same simulation loop at the same time step, like everything's running together and like we can, we can it's much easier to reason about. Um, and to look at the actual implementation of that animate, animate function is actually kind of cool. Cause like we can now represent this animation as just a loop, um, which is like, okay, this loop actually runs over many frames, um, which is kind of like, it's kind of weird, right? It, it's a little bit weird if you're, if you're not used to it, but like we're, we're going through this, the while loop is the one I'm talking about. The for loop is just related to the fact that you can pass in multiple properties, but that while loop is the animation. So like we say, and and it reads pretty pretty nicely too, because like we're like, okay, is right now uh, less than the end of the animation? Like the time right now, is that, the end, the, is that less than the time that this animation is supposed to end? If it's not, then like do one step of the animation. Um, and then the important line is that yield there that yield there says like, okay, I'm done with my work for the frame. Um, and we'll probably have a, again, we'll probably have a function that says like yield next next frame or something. Um, uh, like I'm done with my work for the frame, like like resume this function, resume right at that line, next frame in, in the system. And so, um, yeah, so the, this while loop just runs until completion. Uh, and then when the animation's done, it'll, it'll, it'll run the rest of that function, clean up some stuff and then, and then that, that coroutine has ended, that function returns. And you can return a value from this function too, like at the end, if you wanted to. Um, so yeah, this is still like a pretty pretty uh, early concept we're playing with, but uh, it, it's feeling pretty nice. And we're finding like more uses for it as we as we start to play with it. Um, so I think I think this will probably play a pretty big role in, in, in the way we write stuff, um, but we'll see. Thank you for watching. What is driving the decision to move out of A-frame? Yeah, there, that, that's explained. Uh, yeah, yeah. I would, I, watch, I would watch the last stream. Um, uh, uh, yeah, the, the, that yeah. PR um, explains it um, by just going through the goals there. Um, but then the, we also did a stream last week kind of going over that PR and explaining the goals, the motivations, the non-goals. Um, so I'll just check that out. What was the profiler you were showing last week? I think the, um, the Chrome dev tools profiler, or maybe it was in Firefox. I'm guessing. Uh, yeah, I think we did. Cause we looked at the saw, the, the bad sawtooth pattern thing we have. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, which, which still is in there. Like we haven't done okay. enough work to get rid of that, but, um, you know, we, we should see that eventually, uh, eventually kind of getting less bad. Where is that? Um, uh, I think you gotta select a, a region and then hmm. I think it might just be too zoomed in. Like, uh, I think your, your dev control, oh. my, like your dev tools are just too big, I think. 
Oh. Um, Maybe. Um, I forget where this is. I think just you turn everything select on. A, select a region. Yeah. At the top. Uh, yeah. Uh, Usually there's like something here about yeah. memory, right? Scroll down in that section, maybe. Oh, scrolling just changes the window I'm looking at. Oh, okay. All right, we fixed it. There's no memory. Oh, maybe I didn't um, record. Uh, oh, I think, are you in? Yeah, you're in the performance tab. Uh, did I not do good? Oh, there it is. Okay, I don't know what I did wrong last time, but it's here. Yeah, and that's bad. Um, <laughs> I mean, we don't really want to see this. Sawtooth we're going to see some of it, I think. Um, but like, we don't really want that exactly. Like, that's not good. Um, the other thing we can see in this is like each. Uh, you can see that work that's happening in between frames. We want to like get rid of that as much as possible too. Um, right. So, like the, the big, big chunks, chunks are the work. Are actually, the animation frames. Um, the stuff in the middle is like other things happening. Some of it's unavoidable, right? Because some of it is like, okay, well, I got a message from a web socket. Um, and so we're, we're going to get that in between frames. Um, and we also may want to schedule work between frames in, in certain cases too, uh, like on purpose, uh, but we just don't want to do it on accident. We want to mm -hmm. know when we're doing it. Um, Look how much empty space there is. <laughs> so much room for activities. Yeah, um, I mean, this is good. That means we're hitting frame. Uh, mm -hmm. And the GPU uh, is but that, But that is, a, that is a reason why we, we don't necessarily always want to schedule everything during a frame, right? Because like we do have this space in between frames to be doing stuff. And it's a shame to not be doing it if we have some work that makes sense to do then. Um, mm -hmm. so we just want, we just want the right tools to be able to think about, uh, to think about that, like, cause we want to know when, when they're running. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, I think that's probably a good place to pause, yeah. um, uh, hopefully this answers all the questions about the networked door uh, and like networking state in this new system. This code is not live, but should be in a relatively short amount of time. It is um, on a branch though, right? I think, well, what is the name of this branch if people want to start playing with it uh, with the, the understanding that it is literally going to be changing potentially drastically daily? <laughs> um, it is the load media branch for now. Um, and the goal of the branch is just to basically have an alternative for media loader component that, that loads the various types of media and, and replicates that. And then we'll probably ship it behind a flag to start with because we haven't re-implemented like object menus in the new world. And um, I don't want to, I don't want to have this be a gigantic long lived yeah. branch if we can avoid well, it. And so we want to start like working with this stuff because, because it, it all, you know, loading a GLTF with all the new stuff is a thing we want to be able to start experimenting with so we can start doing this stuff. Yeah. Um, one, one thing actually like that is interesting to look at, like if we compare the code for media loader, like that, that load media function we saw that was like nice and like linear, it's like, okay, here's what happens. And we compare that to the old media loader. Um, it's not quite a fair comparison because we haven't implemented everything yet, but like it is a lot easier to reason about. Um, and and again, like this is a bit uncharitable to the old one because like also there's a lot more stuff inlined in here that, that you know, we've broken out into a function on the left side. But um, so like a line, uh, you know, line count comparison is not the right thing. But like just the fact that we were able to like represent this in a nice linear way um, is a lot easier to reason about than the thing on the right. Um, The thing on the right had an interesting property, which we implemented and did a lot of work to support, but like probably wasn't important. Media loaders sort of support you changing out the source. So like you loaded a video and then you just like change it to be a model and then you just change it to be an image. Um, we don't do that anymore. If you want a different 
object just load a different object yeah the way the way we would support that now is just you would remove the media loader um it would clean itself up or whatever and then you would just add a new media loader yeah. um i think that that's just a cleaner way to do it um especially because like like you said i don't think we've ever used that functionality um and I don't believe that it works, even if it <laughs> like just looking at that code, like I, I would be surprised if actually changing the source of a media loader works. The source type we do actually change the source of um the avatar media loader. So like on I think that's true. I think your player has a media loader and we switch it, but it actually might just have a GLTF model plus. I don't remember. Um I think it actually just has a GLTF model plus now that I think about it, because we don't get loading cubes and stuff on the avatars. I can't point to a specific issue, but I feel like in this old code, un unless I'm missing it, if you create like a media image and you're loading the image, and then you delete the object, this code still just sort of runs asynchronously to completion. Um, uh, um... Oh no, it's like this, no way to cancel promises. So if sources change or if the entity was removed while we were creating the texture, we just throw it away. So we do handle it. Um, but each of these loaders is kind of like handling it in a unique way. Yeah. Um, and yeah, all of the loading code happens in between frames as we were mentioning. And yeah, hopefully, hopefully it gets more manageable. Yeah, I mean, it, I it's feeling a lot better already to me. Just just the um, as we've been adding, you know, we wrote we wrote the image thing, and then we added GLTS, and then we started working on videos yesterday. Um, and each new thing is like, okay, this slots in nicely to the current code. Uh, they all all each code path looks almost exactly the same. Like like loading images and loading videos, it's like okay, create the texture for both. Uh, you know, create the entity from that texture, and then you're done. Um, and so. Uh, it's it's starting to fall into place nicely, I think. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, well, unless there's any last minute questions, I think, uh, or or suggestions for next stream would be a good a good thing. I don't know. I don't know what we want to do next time, but definitely want to keep keep doing this stuff. Um, I think it's it's hopefully helpful. I think I think people have said that they're enjoying it. And um, yeah, I mean, I think um, some of what we might do is just, you know, continue doing uh, explanations of the stuff we're implementing as we're implementing it, or maybe even implementing some more of this stuff live. Uh, the, the, the hesitant, like my only hesitancy to do it live is like, I don't want to waste people's time with, with some of the stuff. <laughs> um, oh, I do, I do want to publish the video of, um, of our first attempt at doing this network door thing because it was before we had implemented any of the media loading stuff. And um, so I'll, I'll see if we can get that out. Somehow. <laughs> if nothing else, if you watch that and then you go through a similar feeling, you might start asking yourselves, maybe the things that I need just haven't been implemented and, right, I'm trying right. to do something, and I should ping them and be like, hey, I need to be able to load GLTF models. Right, right. If what you're doing feels super out of place, then maybe we just haven't built what you need to build on top of. Right, and that's not to say that you can't build it. Uh, we're, 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 we uh, we don't have yeah. to be the ones building it. But like, if something's awkward, maybe we don't have the right primitives yet to do the thing. And either that's something we're, we've thought about, it, or it's something that we haven't thought about yet. And we're like, oh yeah, that actually is something we're missing from the the set of tools that that we need to build stuff. Um, All right, cool. This was fun. Yes. Thank you, everybody who came <laughs> and watched. Um, we don't specifically use Scrum or anything um, on the the team that's working on. Um, and don't don't end your screen share yet. I think that'll screw up the uh, OBS. Thing. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, but um, we definitely, like I said, if nothing else during these streams, just sharing kind of the stuff we've been working on that week um or or you know whatever since the last stream whatever it is um i think would be a would be a cool place to start if there's nothing else yeah and like and like once people start using the the stuff i would love to talk to you and like look at what systems you're building and that might be like a fun way to do one of these weekly things like mm -hmm. you walk us through something you've made 
Yeah, and 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 again, I would say like this stuff is evolving very rapidly. Um, so just be ready for that when you're working with it, but don't let that dissuade you from working with it. Cause like, we really do want to know if what we're building is, is useful to people and, and, and solving the kinds of problems you guys are trying to solve and, and features you're trying to implement. All right. Um, thanks everybody. Let's talk again soon. Do the magic to end.